Titania, Chris, welcome to Dad Edge. How are you? So good. good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm not on spring break though, like you are. Well, there's there's a difference between a vacation and a trip. <laughs> I'm on a trip with kids. Not I can't even. I can't even believe you just said that because me and my family we just went down to spring break. Uh, last week and we were in Florida as well. And people were like, how was your vacation? I was like, it wasn't, it was a trip. When you, when you have four boys, it is not a vacation. There's no relaxation. It is active. Very active. Yes. Yes. So you have four boys, Chris, tell Larry how many children you have. I have four also, but my oldest is my daughter, Lauren. She's a 10th grader. And then I have three boys who are 11, 11 and nine. So all we take are family trips. I haven't had a vacation in decades. I don't know what you're talking about. So yeah, it's not there, there is a massive difference. Yeah. And Andrea, my wife is here in the room with me and I'm getting lots of amens and hallelujahs from the background here. So <laughs> four kids. And even after the twins, you decide to go for another one. Hey, that that's God's sense of humor. Okay. I, I see you. I feel you. Having three boys under 20 months. See, I'm I'm a former CPA. Everything in life lines up better in rows and columns. There's spreadsheets for everything. Right. That was not in a spreadsheet. Nowhere. No. Nowhere right. in our premarital counseling. None of it. So that was an awesome joke that I'm so glad took place. So yes, we have a set of twin boys and uniquely one, I have a set of fraternal twins, Grant and Cole. Grant was born with Down syndrome. His fraternal twin was not. So you add that to the mix with a hello, awesome 20 months later, here's another one. It was a joy. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are watching this on YouTube, I think you just saw the joy, right? All of it. There, there is joy, right? But there's also like, oh my gosh, like, what is this going to be like? My wife and I call our fourth, uh, the Memorial Day baby, because it took us forever to get pregnant with the first. Uh, actually, we needed some help. And then we had our second and without any help. And then there was like a five-year stretch and we had our third. We're like, oh, wow, I guess we're not done. We thought we were done, but we're not. And then Memorial Day, like we got together with, with neighbors. We had few too many drinks and we were like, Hey, let's go have some fun. And like, Oh, let's not be careful. Like what's, what's the worst that could happen? We're fine. That one time turned into that blessing. So I feel you on that one. And he came quick too. So 20, it was actually 20 months between my youngest and yeah. Or my, my third and my, I say, I'm confused. Yeah. When you, when you have four. Yeah, you get it. I joke with people because they ask me what it was like. I'm like, we got through it. What's amazing, Larry, and maybe you can relate is I have basically no memory of life from 2010 till about 2012. And the <laughs> irony is that Andrea and I were awake for most of it. Like I should have vivid memories of like 22 hours of every day and I got nothing. So it's traumatic. You brought, you blocked it out. That's what happened. <laughs> Tanya is just laughing at us. I am. Yeah. I just have one. <laughs> But now, I mean, you're living in middle school boy range now. I mean, this is a whole oh, yeah. awesome spot too. As a former middle school youth pastor, I get the crazy chaos of that age too. So it's all good. We each have our spots. Yes, we do. When my wife and I have one around, which we never do, never <laughs> leave, ever. We feel like we're on vacation, especially Ooh. if they're one of my oldest, because they're just like, we're like, what, 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 what do we do? Like, isn't there somebody we need to serve something to or somebody who needs something? And yeah, but anyway, uh, timely topic. Obviously you guys are on here to talk about how we can protect young eyes. And this is, these, these are scary times, like very scary times because the three of us did not grow up this way. We, we played, I, I might, I'm probably just aging myself here. I'm probably older than both of you guys, but Atari, Nintendo, those were our quote unquote screens. There was no internet. I remember when the internet, it was like, a, I think a DOS system was my first email address, but like, it looked like code on the screen. Like it was boring to check your email. There was nothing fancy about it. I think it was right around college that the internet sort of just kind of started to emerge for me, but we're dealing with all kinds of crazy stuff in this day and age as a as it uh, pertains to protecting our kids. But I want to just do an overview of both of your companies and what they do. So Chris, you want to kick us off? 
Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, Larry. And I think I'm right there. I mean, all three of us are in that Gen X range, I think. So we can relate to all that you're talking about, no matter where we're at in that Gen X range. What's really interesting about what you just said, though, about your recollection about what the internet was and it coming to be is that many of the laws that protect our children today in 2021 are about as old as that Unix code-based email that you remember in college like I do at Western Michigan back in the 1990s, which is one of the primary issues that we try to tackle at Protect Young Eyes. So protectyoungeyes.com is an organization that I founded almost accidentally as a middle school youth director when I saw a need in parents who were asking me a lot of questions about new apps that were showing up, right? If you can imagine a world where Instagram was new or Snapchat was new, they asked me questions. And before I was in ministry, I was a full-time consultant with Ernst & Young. I did that for 12 years. So I left the business world. Lord called me into full-time ministry, which is a crazy transition, but it was awesome. And that was a problem that I felt that I needed to solve for families. And that was this disconnect between what kids were experiencing and what their parents, their analog parents were had in terms of their experience. And so Protect Young Eyes just really came out of a need that I observed to try to fill in that gap with education and information. And that was back in 2015-16 that evolved then into presentations, which we began doing hundreds of them all over the country with a six or seven person presentation team, which then changed pretty radically because of COVID, where we watched most of that aspect of what we do evaporate really in about two or three weeks back in March of 2020. But we still stand very squarely in that gap between parents who intentionally want to protect their kids and or show them how to use technology well. And frankly, big technology organizations that care nothing about the safety and protection of children because there's no accountability for them to care. And so I started the description by talking about the antiquity of our laws. And that is, in addition to the education and the presentations and the website and the Protect app, which we've now released as a more pandemic proof way for us to educate parents, what I spend most of my non sleeping hours thinking about is how do we change the laws that regulate these technologies? What if we lived in a world where we cared as much about the safety and protection of our young people with as much intentionality in digital spaces as we do in physical spaces? Imagine if we treated our children with the same amount of disregard as we do on iPhones, as at playgrounds or on bicycles or on big wheels or all the other physical places that they spend time. It doesn't make any sense. And so we feel, to me, that is the primary problem that my life right now needs to be dedicated toward. And that is creating, helping to create laws that actually catch up to the digital risks that exist for young people today because they don't do the job currently. So that's Protect Young Eyes, mission, heartbeat, things that kind of make me tick. And um, yeah, that's how I describe it, I guess. And there is so much there because even as you said that, I've never considered that because if you think about like we would never allow a child in a room with a predator, you know, a sexual predator in real life, but somehow, some way we, I don't want to say we allow it, but there's really, they can still get to your kids, right? Um, Yeah. It's not that we allow it in the like encourage it sense. I think that's the sentiment that comes to mind. I equate it to this. It's like we sell cars with seat belts in the trunk underneath the spare tire. Every single smartphone has parental controls in some capacity on it, but we hide them deep and we care a whole lot more about the user experience with widgets and Apple Pay and all these other things, revenue generating things, because there's no accountability or regulations that are forcing me to care more about kids. So imagine getting in a car accident and then a police officer saying, why don't you have the seatbelts set up in the car? You're like, what seatbelts? What are you talking about? Oh, wait, they're in the trunk under the spare tire. That's what it's like when young people encounter pornography and parents, for whatever reason, be it complexities or life situation or lack of knowledge, didn't know 
were selling cars with seat belts in the trunk when they should be installed. We should be treating kids with as much care in those digital spaces. So I know I'm on a little bit of a bender. This is obviously a topic that's very, very near and dear to me. It just seems so illogical that we treat such precious human beings with so much disregard in this one place where millions of them are spending time. Yeah, you're definitely striking a chord because most parents, I think, look at these iPhones or Androids and we're like, where do I even start with this thing? It has so many buttons, has so many things. I don't even know where to start or where to begin, right? Uh, Titania, I want to get to you and what you do with Bark. And so share your story with us as well. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> before I talk, though, I'm still reeling from Chris. Every time uh, I have the honor of, of listening to Chris McKenna, um, it really strikes a chord. And after this, I'm probably going to go to Instagram with your permission, Chris, to, to you know, post about the fact that, did you say all or most, like all of the laws or most of the laws are, are 20 plus years old? The ones that we depend on the most uh -huh. and the two that I go to most frequently are CDA 230. That's yep. the Communi Communications Decency Act of 230 uh, or Section 230 of the Communi Communications Decency Act. That's from 1996. And then the other one that we most often lean on, right, is COPPA, the Children's Online yeah. Privacy and Protection Act, which was 1999 to 2000 when Senator Markey um, got that through, who coincidentally is still a senator and he's the one who recently signed the letter with Blumenthal and one other to mm. call out Facebook for Instagram kids. So he's still in the game, which is awesome. It's incredible. But here we are 22 years later from his first attempt to protect kids from exploitation. So those are the two that I usually point to. Yeah. So my, my soundbite slash social post after this is going to be, you know, <laughs> the laws that are meant to help protect your kids are older than the social media platforms that they're on. Like, that's just, anyway. Okay, you asked about me. I will now talk about me, but not really about me, uh, about Bark. And so Bark is a tech company that helps protect over 5 million children across the US. And our tech is not only used with families, but it's also used across schools across the nation, um, over 2,700 districts, in fact. And so what does that mean? And why is it called Bark? So I'll start with the why is it called Bark? So, you know, mo you know most families have a pet, family dog, right? And when strangers come by or, or there's danger, perceived danger, the dog will bark and let you know. That's what Bark does for you, for your kids when they're on tech. We send alerts to let you know when your children have encountered problematic issues like cyberbullying, sexual content, thoughts of suicide and depression, potential drug use, online predation, and more. And why am I here on your podcast talking about it? I'm the chief parenting officer of the company. I wish it was my idea. I wish I had thought of it. Uh, I did not, but I was fortunate enough to join the company. Our CEO, Brian Basin, is a dad of two, and he was actually working at Twitter at the time, realized there was no good way to keep his own two boys safer online, knowing what he knew about tech and social media. Uh, so he left, took a big risk, and we're all so thankful he did. Um, quickly, the way Bark works uh, is using artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. So it's not um, just going to be like a mirror of everything your kid's doing thrown onto your phone so you can spy on them. You're not going to just be alerted to super obvious keywords like marijuana and sex. It's, it's really taking into account the conversational nuance of children, specifically teens and tweens. And we will call out when there's something you really need to look at and pay attention to and get help with, and then ignore all the other stuff that doesn't need to waste your time. Yeah, I think that's one of the, I mean, I've been a big fan of Bark for a long time. Uh, ever since I was introduced to the technology by one of our neighbors, actually, one of my son's friend's parents. And I was, I was just completely impressed with, with the technology. We've been a user of it now for a year and a half, two years, I think. And we have it on both of my boys' phones. And the cool thing, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of things, like I, I get alerts every day because the software is very sensitive. But I take that, I love that. 
I would, I would much rather be too sensitive than not enough, but it'll pick up on keywords. And it also, I like how it also evolves with the words that these kids are using today. So it's like super smart technology. It's not, it's not just going to pick up the word marijuana or sex or depression or suicidal ideation, but it also picks up words like Bay, B-A-E. And I was like, so my son is, is talking to this girl right now and he always calls her Bay. And I was like, what is Bay? I had to Google the word Bay. Bay is short for babe. And I was like, wow, I had no clue, but I've been getting alerts like, hey, there, and I can't remember how it even categorized it, but I was like, oh, he has a term of endearment for her. How cool is that? So that is lovely. <laughs> that is just lovely. Yes. So let's talk about this. Chris, I know you were involved with a movie that is on Amazon Prime as well as on YouTube. Uh, and I know Bark actually launched their own smaller movie that I saw about a year ago, but share with us what this was and what it was all about. Yeah. So the two different pieces of content there, there was, I think what is commonly referred to as the bark predator video, which was this horrifying experiment in just showing the extreme vulnerability that particularly young girls have on a platform that still has a lot to do in order to adequately protect young people. Again, we know that millions of young people use this application. And then from there, um, Larry, I was uh, honored to be invited by Bark, who is also the idea behind Childhood 2.0, which was this gathering of subject matter experts. And the real stars of Childhood 2.0 are the young people who they had in this. So what you had were not only, you know, doctors and internet safety experts and Titania and Brian from Bark and others just talking about what we see from kind of the parent and adult level, but you had gut-wrenching testimony from a tribe, a pod of young teenage girls, and also some um, young men looked like some had recently graduated, just sharing about their real in-the-trenches everyday experiences with cyberbullying, with you know, nudes and pressure and um, anxiety and all of these different pornography, all of these issues that really added so much context and depth to the story. It wasn't just a bunch of adults pontificating about the evils of technology, because I think, I, Larry, we're just getting to know each other, but I know that Titani and I are both pro-technology parents. Like we want our five children respectively to learn how to use technology in a good and a positive way that's full of integrity and light and brightness. But to hear through those teens, what they experience every day, and it's not that it was just a bunch of teens who are all just you know depressed and hooked on porn and that it wasn't that they were just sharing what they see. And you know, I have a teenage daughter. I see some of this through her lens too and through her friends, but to hear their testimonies was so, so powerful. So for parents, I think the real, when I talk about childhood 2.0, it's watch it and then use it as a jumping off point to create conversation with your children. Don't just watch it as this kind of one and done movie. And that was great, but use it as a ongoing conversation Then invite your kids into that. Maybe they watch it with you as a way to say, is that really, it, it, have you ever experienced that curious instead of condemning, right? Open instead of closed, use it as a bridge instead of a barrier to say, Hey, let's chat about this stuff. Not because I want to, you know, condemn you for it because I am floored and I am so sorry as your parent that I probably have not appreciated how hard it must be to grow up today. And I think the movie more powerfully than anything else does that. I want it to increase empathy in adults. It's hard to be a parent today, but it's even harder to be them. And we need to appreciate how ridiculously difficult it is to be an adolescent or a teenager today. I would not want to do it again. I couldn't imagine. I was bullied as a kid growing up. I was, I was the fat kid growing up. I didn't find fitness and health until I was about 17, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about going home after school is that the bullying stopped. Didn't have to worry about it. But with these devices, you never leave as a kid you're always in a quote unquote room or an environment where someone could get to you, right? 
So you really don't ever get that break. And I think we're seeing an increase in teenage suicide these days. I mean, depression, anxiety, all these things. Can you share with us one or two moving stories and experiences from this film? Um, you know, I think there was this, so uh, I'll get emotional because I can't not. So as a former middle school youth pastor, like the most crushing situations I had to deal with were always related to suicide, right? There's just something about that issue as a guy who loves life that I find so devastating that a young person could ever get to the point where life is not worth living. And there is testimony towards the end of um, mom and dad who were just totally caught off guard by their seemingly, and this is the kind of the cliche story, but I don't want cliche to then make us feel like it's not important, but it's a common story today because social media makes it so easy to put on masks and to look a certain way. And their son and him taking his life and then getting to his phone and seeing what he was really dealing with. And it just really, really struck a chord with me. And there's just nothing that ever makes the issue of suicide less impactful. <laughs> Every single time I think about it, it just, it just breaks my heart. And that story I've seen and heard way too many times. And I think coming out of a time of greater isolation, when we saw that Social media was a good short-term surrogate for relationships, but it certainly is not a replacement for relationships. I think we are now on the cusp of even more and more young people. And I know the statistics at Bark support this in their 2020 report. And I know that maybe even coming out of the first quarter here to Tanya, I'm guessing that Bark will see even more right of this sort of detection and um, sort of that mental health tension as more and more kids are coming out of that COVID lockdown period. So that's the one story that just really sticks with me, Larry, because it's an issue that is um, just so crushing to me. So, you know, you said something there that I think all the parents in the audience just perked up and was like, I didn't know that he or she was in that place. You know, sometimes I can't remember what the tagline is with Bark, but sometimes all the clues and the breadcrumbs are in the phone or there's something along that line. And that's absolutely true. I have to tell you, the one thing I do love about the Bark technology is getting those breadcrumbs and those clues to start a conversation that I otherwise wouldn't have done as a parent because I respect my kids' privacy. And, you know, my, my oldest, he's 15 now. And I got an alert from Bark letting me know depression, severe. I'm like, oh boy, like this is, and it was kind of uncommon, especially my older one. Like I had no idea. I mean, I could assume, I mean, I guess I'm not, you know, completely naive to the fact that when you're on lockdown and you're not in school and everything is virtual school and you're in your room in front of a screen, but I will say this, he had a conversation with one of his friends about how he was depressed. He had so much anxiety. He felt so alone in his room and he just wanted to be around people again. And I, I saw this, I got the alert and I looked at it. I was like, oh my gosh, I wonder how bad this is. And I went downstairs later on that night and I'm like, hey man, like, how are you? Like, it was normal. I always put him to bed and I'm like, tell me about your world. Like what's going on for you these days? Like the good, the bad, the ugly. How are you feeling? And he completely opened up. We ended up talking for an hour and a half about where his headspace was at, how much he missed school, friends. He was depressed. He felt isolated, like up to the point where he was telling me, I don't even really feel like getting in the shower anymore these days. And I'm like, wow. So being the typical man, you want to fix that, right? You want to fix that. You want to take that pain away. But instead we started talking and conversing and he was able to then design what it was that would bring him back to life. Things like, Hey man, like I know things are tough right now, you know, and we can't really help school right now. We kind of got to make the best of that situation. However, when you're not doing your schoolwork, how might we connect in a way we never have 
given the circumstances that we're in that we've never been in? What would feel right to you? And that one question turned into an entire question of our family of how might we come together as a family in 2020, given the circumstances that we've never been in. And what we decided from that one conversation, from that one alert that I got from Bark that then cascaded into a conversation with my oldest, then perpetuated into a conversation with my family. As a family, we decided we're going to take 12 adventures over the summer. Dad's going to not work every Wednesday, take Wednesdays off. And the rule is this, 12 adventures, 12 weeks, go somewhere you've never been, do something you've never done. And we are in the process right now of of basically getting all these photos together of all these things we did in 2020. And we want to put something on our wall downstairs that said 2020 didn't stop us. Thank you, COVID, for the memories. And it all perpetuated from that alert that I got from Bark that I otherwise wouldn't have known. So I think that that's phenomenal. So I want, I want to go ahead and give the mic back over to, to Tanya. I want you to talk about the nine minute video that Bark released that I saw at Dad 2.0 last year in February. Yeah. Wow. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing that story um, about the Bark Alert and how it impacted your family. And I still have goosebumps. Like when that wall is finished, please send me a picture. Like that is incredible um, and inspiring. Um, but back to the, the nine and a half minute project um, where Bark went undercover as various personas online, but most notably an 11 year old girl on Instagram and a few other places. And we created this profile for this 11 year old, very, very benign, very benign flowers, coffee mugs, just very, very benign stuff, right? Nothing overtly sexual at all. Um, and within moments of creating the account and posting content. We had adult men uh, in the DMs looking to speak with her, uh, eventually meet up with her in real life, soliciting photos, live, live chatting. Um, it, it rocked our world. We just, we, even though we deal with this every day with the alerts that we have to send and the predators we have found and escalated to law enforcement, just to see it in first person, firsthand um, was so jarring, you know, cause we've had the luxury of having a more innocent childhood. We didn't have to uh, be exposed to those sort of things, at least not digitally. And now a child can be sexually abused without ever having been in the same room as their abuser. And that's, that's where we find our kids now. Um, and you know, over the course of the pandemic, our alerts around online predation increased 23%, which is terrifying and heartbreaking. Um, and even the FBI released, you know, a PSA of like, you know, parents, please pay attention to this. Like your kids are home and they're basically sitting ducks because they're just spending even more time online. And so are the predators, um, you know, it's one thing to tell a parent there are X, Y, Z dangers. You can show them stats. You can even send them links to news stories of things that happen to other kids, but it's just so far removed from them because everybody, myself included, falls victim to the not my kid syndrome. It's not going to be my kid. If it's my kid, I'll know. I'll just know, but it's not going to happen to my kid. But that is incorrect. Uh, statistics show uh, this happens to a much larger percentage of children than you might think. You know, one in four girls, one in six boys will be a victim of, of childhood sexual abuse before they turn 18. And um, to experience the abuse firsthand through this persona, I feel finally brought it home for everyone in a way that had never been done before. Can you share some more detail? about that video because I believe the person who played the 11 year old girl, quote unquote, the 11 year old girl was a 38 year old woman who just looked really, really young. And then you guys did some things digitally and with camera and makeup and that kind of thing. You actually made her look up in between like 11 and 13. So this was like a real person that wasn't just like a 
quote unquote profile that you had created. And you're right. It was very benign. It was like your typical, like uh, tween innocent Instagram. And wasn't it, was it like 90 seconds upon launch of this profile? Something like that. I don't, I don't oh, yeah. remember. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't like 10 minutes. It was when I'm within, I'd say 90 seconds. Um, I was there. I was holding up my iPhone as like a benchmark with the timer running to see. And it was, we were floored. Um, and yes, there was uh, a woman, we utilized her as a persona. We also utilized other, um, other women as personas, myself included. Um, if you see the childhood Tudor documentary, um, which is 90 minutes of this and more, um, you'll see me as an 11 year old. And it's really freaky because I went back and looked at pictures of me when I was actually 11 and it's pretty spot on. Um, and it's, you know, when we were undercover as a 17 year old or a 15 year old, like it was hard, but if you are a, a, a prepubescent child online getting these sort of things, it's just depraved. And the younger we went, the younger we went, the worse it got. That is absolutely crazy. Hey, can I ask you a quick favor? Yeah. Can you, when you talk, can you move your mic up just a bit? Cause yes. you, sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. I'm animated. Um, that, no, that's, it's just kind of rubbing on your shirt and it's creating yeah. like little, but that, so repeat that one more time. The younger, the younger, that we went in our personas, the more depraved it got. It was sick, like 17 year old. Okay, they're almost 18, 15 year old. We get it, 15 year olds can sometimes look like 18 year olds. 11 years old, like not even hitting puberty. Um, it's just, just sick, just wrong. And even younger, and it got worse. That is absolutely mind blowing that that as a parent that just makes you on fire angry yeah so angry and the, the other thing too like one in six boys so boys i mean they're not immune to this they are not immune to this they are absolutely not immune to this um you know one thing that is that did stand out uh with this project is that every single offender every predator was a man we did not see any female uh, offenders, not to say there aren't any, but they are typically men. But as far as victims go, uh, yeah, one in six boys, one in four girls. Um, and the stigma surrounding it too is something that we need to address. Um, before the Me Too movement, coming out and saying that you, you know, have experienced this or have addressed this just felt not necessarily like a relief. It felt like, you know, a big, a big bullseye was now on your back as this, as damaged goods. I can say that because I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And I, I'll never forget when I told my story, I wasn't like, whoo, 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 relief. You know, it was like, oh gosh, now everybody knows. And what will they think of me? And, and now my damaged goods and, um, it wasn't, it wasn't liberating whatsoever. Um, so I think that the more, the more we can shed light on the fact of how common this is and how detrimental it can be, uh, to your life, both in the short term and long term, and get, get these victims, the help they need, the therapy they need so they can live full, productive, healthy, fulfilling lives. Uh, it's critical. So, I just want to acknowledge and appreciate you for a second. I didn't know that about you. Thank you for sharing that. Extremely authentic, very vulnerable thing to, to say. Is that one of the biggest reasons you do the work you do? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I was, when I was six years old, I was molested by uh, a babysitter that we found through my church, you know, and my mom was a single mom. She's trying to make ends meet and trusted this person to take care of her children when in fact uh, they were doing the opposite. And um, there's so much, you know, guilt and shame that I even personally had because 
you know, I was six. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know it was bad. I didn't know what was happening until I was about eight years old and I was watching Saturday morning cartoons. And um, you remember how NBC used to have the more, you know, PSAs with like the rainbow. Yeah. So they had one of those about sexual abuse. And I remember watching it and thinking, that's terrible. I can't believe that happens to people. And all of a sudden it was like one of those like limitless moments where I was like, oh my gosh, that happened to me. And I told my mom, but I was scared. I didn't want to talk about it. And I did, I, you know, I, I just, anyway, I, I was scared. And I have a lot of guilt and shame because fast forward to a few years ago when I looked this person up uh, and they're now in the Georgia database of uh, dangerous, violent sex offenders. And so if I would have spoken up, maybe other people would have not been uh, impacted by this person. Um, so I don't know why I started talking about that, but <laughs> anyway, yes, that is one of the reasons why I do what I do. One of many, one of many. I, um, I have a very strong faith uh, and I want to caveat that by saying like, I, I'm not saying I'm a strong Christian because I think sometimes that connotes like I'm perfect and I follow all the 10 commandments very well and I don't make mistakes and I don't sin. I make mistakes every day. Um, I am a Christian. I believe that God has a plan for my life. I'm so grateful for the redemption uh, and the grace that, that Jesus offers. And um, even though such a large source of my pain came through my, my church family, uh, it's, not, it's not their fault. I'm not mad at God. I'm not, if anything, that happened to me for a reason, I can now use it to impact and help other people and protect other kids. Um, I'd go through it all over again uh, to know that I, um, I'm helping to protect other kids and, and bring light to this darkness issue. How many users for Bark? <laughs> Over 5 million children protected across the nation. Okay. So um, I'm not even going to pretend <laughs> to understand what it feels like to be in your shoes when you were six and then when you were eight and then everything every year and every minute that followed after that. And you mentioned something in there that like, maybe if I would have said something, cause I looked this person up and there was this thing, right? Maybe if I would have said something, which there might be some regret in there, right? Mm -hmm. And, but I want you to think about for a moment, 5 million families protected because of the work you're doing. Think we can't save everybody, but think of the, the lives, the families, the kids that would have otherwise maybe committed suicide. Yeah. The, kid, the kids that were victim have been saved had they had, because a bark alert went off when a online predator tried to reach out to one of their kids. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that I think you can hang your hat on is you are doing amazing work and you're doing it from such heart of gold place because you know what it's like to walk in those shoes. Well, thank you. Uh, it's not, it's not just me. We have a team of sure. over, gosh, we started as a team of eight and now we're over 90 people. And it's, it really is. It's a team. I, I have the honor of speaking about it most publicly, but it's, it's a team and not only a team of internal bark um, employees, but partners, partners like Chris, partners like you, Larry, partners of basically anybody who truly cares about children and their well-being and keeping them safer, not only online, but in real life, they're part of the extended Bark family. So we can all actually um, feel good about this impact that we are all having together. You're such a humble person. <laughs> <laughs> I say that cause I'm the same way. Like, I'm like, Oh no, it's not just me. Like we got a team of coaches. We got this, we got all this, all these resources for dads. I got, but that stuff doesn't happen unless you have good leaders in the seat. Right. I mean, people who are leading the charge, people who are leading the charge with passion. I'm doing the work that I'm doing because I had a chaotic childhood. And when it came to being raised by a father, I'm not going to bore you with my story, but you know, my biological father and mother were divorced when I was one. Mm. I, he was gone. Mm. My mom got remarried when I was four. That relationship lasted six years. It was absolute chaos, lots of drinking, abuse, violence, 
I ran into my biological father by mistake, total accident when I was 12. And then we had a six month relationship. Then we parted ways again. That really sucked. You talk about suicidal ideation, depression, emotional eating. There was a reason I was fat because I want to eat those feelings away. I failed the eighth grade, had to redo eighth grade. Finally went on, went to high school, got my college degree, 30 years old. I found out two things about Starbucks, two things. Number one, you can get a, a coffee for five bucks and you can also run into a biological parent that you hadn't seen in 18 years. I ran into my father when I was 30. And part of the reason I do this, one of the biggest reasons I do this work, and we have a relationship now today, 16 years later, we have a relationship. It's good. And, but what I can tell you is when you've, when you have walked in the shoes of somebody that you're serving now, that becomes a powerful mission because you know, at the heart, at the core, what it feels like to walk in the shoes of someone that you are now serving. And that's, that's what, that's what you guys are. That's what you're doing. That's what your team is doing. And I know there's 90 other people, but it's good work. It's really good work. Thank you. Yeah. So Chris, I, I want to do just one quick, like uh, lightning round between the two of you. And I want, I want you just to share anything that might've been not said yet about things for the future with protecting young eyes, maybe some other things that people don't know, or um, I do want you to do one thing if you don't mind. Can you just educate the parents on some of these seatbelts that are hiding under the tire in the trunk? Because I got to tell you without bark, my seatbelts are still under the tire in the trunk. I have I think my wife controls the boys' phones, like their screen time, and they have to ask permission remotely if they can have more screen time. They have to ask permission to download an app. Um, there's a lot of things that my wife controls from her phone with the boys' phone, but I, I, I don't know the ins and outs of that. And I don't even, maybe that's just scratching the surface. I don't know. Yeah, boy, the, the whole idea of parental controls is a really complicated one. And I really can't stand that label, to be honest, because I think it sets us up for a wrong posture with our kids. Parental controls, like just think about that phraseology. And I think it communicates the wrong message with how I want parents to consider their role in raising young people today. If our goal is to control them, good luck. It's not going to work no matter what we put in place, no matter what software is in place. You cannot fill that gap with enough technical solutions. Those are places that can only be fully filled with relational connection. Technical solutions are necessary, but the real glue between parents and kids in the digital age is the relationship. Then it's a matter of discovering what technical tools based on your child and their age and stage of life work best. Titania would tell you the same thing that I would. Bark isn't the perfect tool for every family. I would say that about any tool. There's no perfect tool. If it were as simple as every family does A, B, and C, then, well, we would codify that and retire on the riches and call it good. But it's not that simple because most of what plagues young people today with technology is neurology, right? It's this neurology game of where they are developmentally with tech that preys sometimes and appropriately on where they are neurologically and how easy it is to get hooked and why do kids look at pornography and all these really complicated questions. It's different for every kid, right? The way that my daughter interacts with Instagram is going to be different than another 16-year-old girl in the way that she interacts with Instagram. So, I'm not doing a whole lot to solve the problems. I'm sure when you ask that question, parents are like, oh, good. Chris is going to give me the one thing and I'll run with that and I can check the box. But there are no set it and forget it parental controls. There are only intentional caring parents. So we like to refer to it as caring control. You find tools, a combination of tools, and those are both technical and relational tools that exhibit a caring control over your kid over where they are. And that evolves over age and stage. And so, you know, that's going to be a combination of an awesome router, awesome solutions like Bark and others that are out there, 
But the only way to really get them across the finish line is with just brutally open and honest relationships, like sitting down with your kids and telling them the things that freak you out about technology, putting in the light, telling them all the ways that you know that they can get around it. Honey, I know that I could put this in place and you're probably still going to find three other ways to digitally ninja your way around whatever I put in place. But you know what? I want to invite you into a relationship with me where you don't choose to do those things. Not because you can't, but because you choose not to. I want to give you that choice. Whenever you give them the option to have agency and ownership in that digital relationship, you almost always increase the probability with which they will obey whatever things you've put in place. Going back to how I started, it's just me trying to control my kid. If we embrace the reality that they already know more, it's a losing battle. And I think there are too many parents, I can be really honest, there are too many parents that want to control their kids into digital submission. And what we inadvertently do is we actually chase them into the exact digital places that we don't want them to go through this authoritative controlling stance. It's the don't touch the wet paint syndrome. And by telling them, I'm going to control you and I'm going to spy on you and all these things, we actually chase them into the places we don't want them to go. And I think there are way too many overprotective parents who out of spirit of wanting to protect their kids are actually in the digital age showing their kids exactly what not to do. (laughs) And so I want to invite them into that sort of digital trust relationship, building one brick at a time by modeling the right ways, by having a posture of curiosity and not condemnation, by being a coach instead of a controller, by doing tech with them. That's co-play, right? Doing tech. I don't understand why my kids watch all the YouTube videos that they do, but I'm going to pretend that I like them and I'm going to sit down and watch them with them because I want them to know that tech is a we activity and not just a me activity. And right now, while the issues are benign, if I build that trust later on when the issues turn into the nine and a half minute Bark Predator video, I want them to know that dad is safe because for years he has shown me that we can do technology together. Long-winded answer to your question with a lot of different paths. I hope that I brought it together there at the end as succinctly as I could, but those are some of the phrases and conversations that I love to have with parents when they start the question with what's the right parental control for my family? Like, ah, glad you asked. (laughs) God, Chris, I thought you were going to give us some tech support here. Jeez, you went off on a tangent of epic proportions. Let me I'm so glad you went there. I really, really am. Because I think what you just emulated here was a, was an environment of psychological safety where we can have conversations about these things where I'm not, I'm not just, I'm not your authoritative figure here, but I'm here to guide you and let me into your world as well. And let me welcome that kind of with you, right? Let me, let me help you navigate this versus beating you into submission of why you can't have this thing, right? We're big on cre- in our family, we're big on creating uh, psychological safety. And I'm not going to get into specifics for the privacy of my son, uh, but I will say this, he's a 15-year-old boy, you can, and you can pretty much know what a 15-year-old boy wants to see, okay? And I got alerts of what was going on. And the cool thing about that is I remember when I was caught with things that he was looking at, and it was guilt, shame, you're going to hell, like all these horrible things, which, by the way, did make me want to just see it more because it was like the forbidden fruit, right? Right. The cool thing about what you just illustrated and it gave me affirmation that we're headed in the right direction as a family is that we were able to have a conversation, guilt-free, shame-free, ask me any question you want. And oh, by the way, I was doing the same stuff, probably more. I just didn't have an iPhone, right? Um, It turned into what is now an ongoing conversation. And I'm happy to say that... um, I didn't have to punish the kid. I didn't want to, and I wasn't going to anyway. But when a couple of occurrences happened, I had, I just simply asked him, I was like, Hey, what feels right to you as far as like just being able to put a container around this? You know, what do you think would be best? He's like, I think I should take Safari off my phone. Okay. Is that what you want to do? Cause we'll, we'll support you in that. Yeah. That's what I want to do. Okay. His decision, he created it, he designed it, and he was able to open up and talk about it like it was any other, oh, it's sunny outside and 
blah, 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 fill in the gaps. Um, so that I'm glad you said that. So if, if parents can take anything from this particular segment, what you said, Chris, is create an environment of psychological safety and connection. Don't use guilt and shame and authoritarian type of uh, type of an approach. You'll probably just push them in the other direction. You don't want them to go anyway. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. And to Tanya, back to you. How about you? And then we're going to let you get back to spring break because we've kept you too long from the beach. You got to get back there. Oh my gosh. So many things, so many things I want to say. Um, first, uh, on the previous topic, I urge everybody listening to this or watching this that are stumbling upon this uh, to watch the documentary Childhood 2.0. Um, you'll hear Chris's uh, specific uh, personal story with those issues. Um, it brought me to tears and his vulnerability and openness on that front is just really moving. So tune into that. And thank you, Chris, again, for, for being so open there. Um, in terms of, you know, if parents can just take away one thing, I'm going to cheat and give you two. So again, watch childhood 2.0. It's just childhood to movie.com. Please, please, please watch it. It's free. Like you have no reason not to watch it except for time. Um, Second thing is whether or not you use Bark or any service that is free or not free, you need community. You need each other. Um, and since Larry and Chris and I are not always on like speed dial, um, you can find that in the Parenting in a Tech World Facebook group. So it's over 109,000 family members right now um, that are on Facebook talking about these things all day, all night. And um, yeah, go there and get some help. So thank you so much. And guys, don't even worry about having to remember all those links because uh, we're going to have them in the show notes for you. Don't even worry about it. We got you. We see you. Head on over to gooddadproject.com forward slash 317 for this show. Again, gooddadproject.com forward slash 317. We're going to have all the links that uh, Titania and Chris mentioned in the show. We'll have the YouTube video from Bark as well as the movie that Chris referenced. And again, Chris, the name of that movie again was what? Childhood 2.0. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Childhood 2.0. We'll have that. And we'll also have our discount code. We are an official partner with Bark. Um, we'll have a discount code in there. Bark has been gracious and wonderful enough to give us 10% off their monthly subscription, which by the way is $8.10. I would pay a thousand dollars for this service. I'm not even kidding. The peace of mind that it comes with eight dollars and ten cents is a drop in the bucket for peace of mind when it comes to this. Uh, go to gooddadproject.com forward slash bark for that. Chris, Tanya, this was amazing. Thank you so much for coming on today. And thank you, especially to Tanya, for taking time away. I had no clue you were on spring break. So thanks for jumping in, you know, off the beach and onto this interview. Well, you're welcome. But just to be clear, I I am not on any break. <laughs> yeah, it's a trip. It's a trip. It's a trip. <laughs> I hear you. Thanks again. Thanks, y'all. Take good care. You too. Gentlemen, go out and live legendary. Take care.